introduce myself. I'm Christopher Gervais. I go by Ergon Logic online on GitHub, Drupal.org, uh, GitLab, um, pretty much anywhere that I'm online. Um, even though that's a Twitter tag, I, I'm not really, I don't do anything on Twitter. But um, anyway, so my presentation is titled Automate All the Things. Um, the idea here is basically that um, all of programming is automation, essentially, of one sort or another, right? Um, we're just getting to a point now where we can automate a lot of stuff that used to be very manual. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're going to look a little bit at the history of cloud computing going back to like the late 1950s, essentially. Uh, we're going to go very quickly right up to um, more or less the present day. Um, then we're going to start looking at infrastructure as code, uh, what it is, what the benefits are, what we're trying to accomplish. And we're going to examine Ansible a little bit closer. Um, Ansible is a tool for uh, configuration management, so similar to Puppet or Chef or CF Engine, that sort of thing. Um, I personally like Ansible a lot, um, and it's sort of the base of most of my infrastructure work that I do these days. Um, and then we'll put it all together with a demo uh, towards the end. So what I'm going to do before we get started is I'm just going to show you briefly. Um, this is Eager. Uh, those of you who know me um, probably know that I'm the project lead for, for Eager, which is a hosting system for Drupal. Um, unlike just about every other conference that I speak at, I'm not talking about Eager today. Uh, this is the application that we're going to deploy on an Amazon EC2 instance. Okay, So this is an example that I just launched as I was madly debugging this before the, the presentation uh, about half an hour ago. And it is running on uh, an EC2 instance, as you can see here. Bear with me. So here's the EC2 instance. Right above it, you see the terminated instance of the prior debugging instance that I had running. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're actually going to destroy this VM. But I wanted to show you that it works, because this is going to be a live demo. And live demos always mess up. So. Uh, you're just going to trust me that we're going to get here at some point, um, and we'll go from there. So, you know, the traditional way of working with these kind of things is to click around in the user interface and do things like this, and say instance state terminate, and it prompts me to confirm, and now it's going to go ahead and tear down that VM, okay? Everything that was installed on it is going to be removed, deleted, and so forth, and then later on when we get back to the demo part, We'll rebuild all of that and get it running again. So let's get back into the presentation. Oh, just in case you were wondering, uh, the site really is down now. So it's just going to spin because there's nothing responding at that IP address. All right. So that's the plan for today. We'll go through it quickly. I'm going to try to get through this stuff at a reasonably quick pace, start running the demo. Most of that's just going to kind of flow by as it runs various tasks. I'll narrate a little bit of that and then answer some questions um, and presumably you know, get into a bit of a discussion around some of that. So I'll try to leave about 10 minutes at the end um, to dig into questions and how you might want to go about implementing these things. So. Um, no presentation at a tech conference is complete without an XKCD slide. And so here is um, mine. This is actually a fairly accurate representation of how people think about automation, right? So you plan it, you've got the work that you're doing, you put in some extra work to get to, to write up the automation for it, eventually that kicks in, and then you have much less work to do to maintain that task. Um, the perception, however, in terms of uh, what this is labeling as reality, is that you start writing the code, then you realize that really you can do so much more with it, you start extending it in all kinds of different ways, and the original task that you were trying to accomplish with it um, essentially gets left in the dust as you go into um, that. So that's, that's essentially where I live. I, I do mostly that. Um, part of the reason for that being that I write these kind of automation scripts to help teams deploy this stuff easily. So it's fine for me to get stuck in that space. The reality, though, is actually closer to the top in a lot of cases. It feels like the bottom. 
but what uh, there's a, in my est uh, uh, estimation anyway, um, there's a, a, a bias that we have where as soon as we've automated something, it drops out of our attention span and we're not even aware that it's still there. So we really do achieve that time, um, the, the, the drop in effective time that we're spending on it. It doesn't result in free time, right? We just take on more work, right? So that's essentially all of computing, right? All of computing is one form or another of this. Um, I like to go overboard, so I have two exit KCB slides. Um, this is a really nifty, uh, handy one to have because it kind of gives you an idea of, depending on how frequently you're running a task, how much time is reasonable to devote to automating parts of that task, right? So I'll give an example here. Say something that you're going to do weekly, like say Drupal updates, right? Um, weekly, maybe monthly, maybe somewhere in between. Let's take weekly as an example. If that takes an hour to run Drupal updates, um, or say let's take two hours, right? And you cut it in half. So you find a tool like Eager, for example, that will cut in half that time. Um, if you're doing that on a weekly basis, you can devote 10 days of time to deploying that fix, to, to getting that automation in place. Um, and over a five-year period, you'll save time, right? That's over a five-year period. So that's, that's how this, this works out. This is handy because a lot of times, I know for me, I'll spend hundreds of hours over the course of months working on something that saves people, you know, five minutes. But um, again, this is where if a dozen people do it, then that's a multiplier effect for, for this. So that's one of the really nice things about open source and, you know, how you can pursue those kind of uh, what might not be immediately obvious as a productive endeavor, um, but it has returns in the long run. So let's take a quick look at cloud computing. And uh, just realized, of course, that the L is capitalized, so oh well. Um, so if you go all the way back to essentially the beginning of um, computing as we currently know it, uh, it was sort of these big, massive, building-sized computers, the skill sets to run them were mostly kind of consolidated, right? You, you would have to essentially know how the system worked in order to be able to program it, in order to be able to operate it. Um, they were so large and so expensive that they tended to be only in sort of the government and academic. Uh, it wasn't cost effective for basically anything else, right? So if you weren't a spy agency trying to decode the Enigma machine, you weren't going to be using one of these kind of things. Um, then, you know, into the, you say, early 70s, somewhere around that range, mainframes really hit their, uh, their stride. Banking, for example, adopted computing wholeheartedly and was thus able to lay off dozens and dozens of people whose job it was to keep ledgers, right? Um, so. That's the kind of automation that was happening there. You started to see a lot more specialization where the people who were able to interact with these systems still needed to write programs and they were often punch cards was how we were entering that data at the time. I say we, even though I have a great beard, it was way before my time, right? Um, but you started to see a lot more specialization. You had engineers that were working at IBM and Cray who were building these systems. You had software, a software industry that had built up to write the software that was being run. Then you had engineers that were maintaining these systems, but then you had a whole level of financial analysts who really didn't need to know much more than some specialized languages for how to query the data and how to enter the data. So you started to see a fracturing of the, the workforce uh, as specialization kicked in. Eventually, um, the PC was released in the early 80s. That uh, eventually became these sort of specialized rack mount servers, and people started to run uh, you know, a server with uh, email running on it, right? And then another server with a file share. Various services like that that became commonplace and then eventually everybody had a desktop, everybody was connecting to these services. Systems administration as a profession uh, was essentially born. Um, and people would specialize even more so, right? So they would specialize in blade servers or something like that on a hardware side. And they would specialize in Microsoft Exchange and how to configure and manage that kind of software. And so you got more and more of that specialization. Obviously, the tech industry 
um, you know, kind of shattered into shards all over the place of different sort of very micro-specialized um, software. Uh, then 9-11 happened, and I was actually selling this kind of hardware and software at the time, and what happened was people got super paranoid about keeping their computers in their offices, because they figured if uh, anybody was going to target them, they were going to target the office, and, but the data was where they felt there was a lot of value. So people started to move their data, businesses I should say, started to move their data into data centers and then look at distributing that um, so that you had uh, no single point of failure where you could you know, shut down a bank by blowing up its main headquarters. Right? Um, so here again, you now have even more specialization. Now you have companies whose job it is just to run the data center. Right? You have people whose job it is to maintain the uh, HVAC system. Right, to just keep everything cool. Um, from our perspective as uh, systems administrators and programmers, again, it got even further removed from the hardware, from the underlying software. A lot of times we would be just logging in via SSH, SFTPing stuff. This is kind of where Drupal really started to kick in. The web started to, to, to really develop at the beginning of, of this stage. Um, and then finally we're at where we are now, um, give or take now, I mean, it's not like it's evenly distributed, but uh, where most of our interacting with the systems that we run our software on is completely abstracted from us. Um, some systems are super simple, like Linode, where you just, you know, you click a button, you get a new, uh, new VM, and you can SSH in, and there you go. Uh, or very complex systems like Amazon, where you've got hundreds of different of, again, even further specialized types of, um, of systems. Um, and computing has really become a utility, but what we're starting to see is now a, uh, a reconvergence of some of the skill sets, right? So the DevOps movement, which I'm assuming everybody's familiar with at this point, um, is looking at how to do sort of more cross-functional work, how to have teams understand what each of them is doing instead of having these strong silos that are dividing everything up. So this all happened. Um, starting around 2006 and largely as a result of the dot-com bust, right? So everybody thought that everybody was going to be buying their pet food online. Um, now, of course, some people do, but at the time it was way ahead of, its, uh, ahead of the curve. And, but huge amounts of money were being poured into it. So people had data centers full of racks of servers and then nobody to buy their specialized widget service uh, online. And so they went out of business but all these servers were living in all of these data centers. And so some smart people bought them at a discount and started selling them as infrastructure as a service. Right? So that's where Amazon started. Um, and a lot of the, there's, there's a number of services that started around the same time, um, basically just taking the commodity hardware that they had and renting it out in some fashion. So it started off as things like co-location at the data center level, but then people put web front ends on it, put an API on it, and then everything just kind of exploded. Sense. Um, that reconvergence started around then too because the ease with which you could, you could launch these things, you still have engineers who are racking servers and all that kind of thing, um, but the, uh, the convergence of being able to click a button and get an infrastructure system in place to, in which you then install your software um, also converged nicely with uh, CF Engine and then Puppet and things like that that allow you to start automating a lot of those tools. So understanding the entire stack becomes increasingly important instead of just you know, your layer, whatever that might be. So there's lots of benefits with cloud computing. There's reasons that it's become the thing that it is. Scalability being one of the, the big ones that people promote a lot. Unfortunately, um, it tends to be sort of overhyped in a lot of cases. Most people don't need the kind of scalability that Netflix has, right? Netflix has to have a system in which when everybody comes home and sits down after supper and turns on their TV, suddenly they have 10 times more capacity requirement than they do at 9 o'clock in the morning, right? So that is a huge difference in terms of how, how their business can operate and, and keep costs at a, at a low point. But very few use cases actually require that level of scalability. The problem that comes with it, though, is that you click a button, you get a new server, makes it really easy to rack up a huge bill, right? Because if my kid were to get a hold of my computer and just, you know, mash the mouse for a bit, 
um, you know, I could have a thousand servers running and, and not know it necessarily. <coughs> and when I say my kid, I also mean the sysadmins that I work with at work, uh, <laughs> developers, the, you know, whoever, right? Um, so the other benefit is, of course, flexibility, right? You can get all kinds of things in place. You don't have to invest a huge amount of money in the hardware, go rent a space in the rack, spend all the time racking it and putting it in, you know, installing everything. It's really a matter of minutes to get this kind of stuff up and running. So it gives you a lot more flexibility to do different things with it. The corollary to that, to some extent, is the fact that with that power of being able to do all of these things, it's much more complex to do any particular thing, right? Um, in some cases, it's, it is just click a button and, and you get what you want. Um, in other cases, though, it can get really, really hairy. Um, and of course, because everything has an API in front of it, it makes it really easy to automate, right? And so tools like Puppet, like Chef, like Ansible uh, have made it a lot easier to deploy not just a single server at a time with a click of a button and fill out a form, but a whole fleet of them in a matter of minutes based on uh, some code that you have. That's great if you know how to do it or if you have the time to invest to learn how to do it. Um, it's hard to hire people to do it though, right? And so, um, you know, people like me get to charge a lot of money to do it. Um, but for businesses, it's a real challenge because you get a, not because they can't afford it, right? But because they just can't find people to do it, to do it responsibly. So let's turn to infrastructure as code and look at what it is and kind of why, why we're doing that. So essentially, infrastructure as code means that you, you write up a description, a declarative description of what it is that you want. Okay? What is it you want to have? Um, and then you hand that over to a tool like Ansible. In this case, this is Ansible. And it will handle actually running that. Okay? So Linode is just like AWS or, or many other cloud providers. It has a UI. I can log in. I can click around and I can create the things and I can check off you know, the various options that I want for any particular system. One of the nice things about how infrastructure as code works is that I don't necessarily need to check off the same box every time I'm launching a new system. I can define what I want these systems to look like in general and then I can just spin those up by right running one command on the command line. Um, as opposed to having to repetitively ensure that I've got all the right checkboxes checked off. One of the challenges with that is that it's not very discoverable, right? If you're not familiar with how to go and look up what the options are available for the node, you're not necessarily going to find, oh, look, there's a new checkbox that gives me the option to set up automatic backups or whatever when I launch my system, right? So. Um, documentation behind this is incredibly important. That's one of the reasons that I like to actually put in a link to the documentation in the, in, to the official documentation within my documentation. One of the main reasons for doing this is uh, to avoid what we call Snowflake servers. Right? So Snowflake servers are unique servers, Snowflakes being unique. Um, as soon as you log into a system and you know, run apt get install whatever, um, the next time you deploy a system like that, it's not going to have that on it, right? You're going to have to do that part of it. So if you can write all of that into code like this, then you never have to redo that. But the more you go in and you change a conf file and you, you do something along those lines, the harder it is to maintain control over that system and to understand how it's going to react in different cases. So when you end up calling a sysadmin in to debug something, they're going to have to go in and dig into it as opposed to having a system that works a lot more like software. The other part that's really nifty about it is that you have your documentation in line, right? So if you're trying to be really responsible about how you manage your infrastructure, you'll be clicking around in the, in the, um, in the user interface for your cloud provider of choice, but you're also going to have a document that says which checkboxes to check off, right? Depending on what you're trying to accomplish, so that you can hand it off to the new guy and say, here, go get me a MySQL server, or something along those lines, right? Um, that's a disconnect between the way that you're doing it and why and how you should be doing it. This is one of the nice things about infrastructure as code. You can put the documentation right where it's required, 
And essentially, because all you're doing is saying, you know, give me this plan at this data center with this distribution, it's essentially self-documenting, right? So you don't need that extra layer of documentation. Um, it makes it more discoverable within itself of what's going on and what you're trying to accomplish. Another nice thing is that it really is code. It's uh, just a text file usually. It's usually YAML or something along those lines. Puppet has its own sort of DSL. Chef has its own DSL. One of the reasons I really like Ansible is that it uses YAML. YAML is also something that you can generate. So you can put, you can do various things to, to create the configuration that you then run, which can allow you to further abstract things. I don't recommend doing that. That's where you get into that like really high curve of spending all your time debugging how you're compiling your variables and stuff. Anyway, never mind. Um, the, so version controlling things is incredibly important when it comes to this. This is one of the ways you would control costs, for example, right? Um, if you're ensuring that people are committing code before they, they run this, uh, you can see who created infrastructure at what time and give them an opportunity to write a little note about why they're doing it. It might link into an issue queue, for example, with the request that they're satisfying by incrementing the number of servers that you have running a particular application or whatnot. Um, and you can then track it back, right? Git blame is wonderful for this kind of thing because it'll show you who is it that made whatever change that may have um, impacted your system in a, in a given way. So it gives you a lot of flexibility around how you can go about uh, managing this and kind of ensuring that things are, are running the way that you want. One of the practices in infrastructure and code in general is to keep things, keep changes to a, 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 like keep them small, right? Don't work for two days and then write a commit message, you know, YOLO, and then there you go, right? Um, if you've got, you know, eight pages to wade through to figure out what this change was that Mike made two weeks ago, right? Because you, you know that Mike made the change. Um, it's hard to figure out what his thought process was, what was it that they were trying to do. So making these, these small changes um, is important on that basis in terms of just being able to understand it, but also because you can then atomically say, this is the wrong thing. So I'm going to revert that and I'm going to replace it with a different change. Right? And then one of our favorite things, of course, is testing. If you're building these things to be um, reusable, you can group con configuration together into something like modules, puppet modules. In Ansible, we call them roles. And by doing so, you can then run automated tests on them. Right? You can define what your software, what your system is supposed to look like, and then run tests against it to make sure that nothing's broken by the latest change that you've made. Now, it requires quite a bit of thought to kind of keep straight what's specific configuration versus global configuration. We'll look a little bit at that later. Um, but this is a, a, something that I always recommend, since infrastructure as code really does make it code. It's the kind of thing that you can dump into Travis and have it build such a system and then tear it all back down and tell you everything's okay. Right? Or leave it up if something goes wrong and you can debug it. So let's take a look uh, a little bit more in depth at Ansible and how Ansible works. So. <clears throat> Again, Ansible is in YAML. YAML is my favorite uh, format for configuration. Uh, Drupal has adopted it as its configuration format, which I was hugely thankful for because they were considering uh, XML previously, which is terrible. If you've ever worked with XML, it's really not a great language for humans to interact with things. YAML is, because YAML looks just like the kind of to-do lists that you might type into a Word doc or something like that. Um, it's natural in the way that it works. The other nice thing about um, Ansible in particular is that, uh, see that name line at the very top? That's optional, but it gives you the ability to describe what it is you're doing in line, right? So it gives you a description sort of field that um, you should obviously make a habit of, right? That actually gets displayed when you're running Ansible, um, and so you can easily track down where this thing is. So if that part fails, and it just means that it's going to be red instead of the, the nice green or yellow um, that it would normally be. It's easy to track down the part of the program or the code where this is breaking down for you. So it makes it really easy on that basis. Uh, it takes discipline to, uh, to include it because it is optional, but it pays dividends like you wouldn't believe. 
So let's just take a look at what the Ansible stack kind of looks like. So first off, we would have Ansible. Ansible itself is written in Python and depends on a number of Python um, modules, right? Uh, the easiest way to deploy Ansible, in my opinion, is using pip, so pip install Ansible. One of the nice things about pip is that it's going to allow you to install different versions of Ansible, whereas if you're using something like uh, the Debian packages, you can't go back and install the last the same one as you had last week. Plus, you can install user-specific ones. So if you say pip install dash dash user Ansible, then you can override the system default with the version that you want to run. And that's particularly useful when you have a distributed team who may be using some advanced features of Ansible that are only available in the latest version. Um, and so you can make it easy for your team to stay up to date and keep on the same version so that you don't get disparity in terms of uh, what the capabilities are. Ansible is a pretty fast moving project. So you get a lot of new features very, very frequently. So if you take advantage of that and somebody hasn't updated in a month, and then they run the code and it breaks. That's where I'm coming from with this pip install is a really great way to do it. I generally actually run it off of Git because I contribute back, but that's a different, you know, that's because I, I really do dive into that upward curve of wasted time. Uh, anyway, so Ansible has sort of a core functionality and then um, almost all of the functionality that you're actually gonna ever interact with. So every time you're writing one of those clauses, right, saying launch me an AWS EC2 instance, um, you're interacting with a module. Modules generally are written in Python, but that's just because it's kind of a community thing. You can actually run them in shell script, or you can, you can write them in, sorry, write them, not run them. You can write them in any programming lang language you want. You just have to kind of standardize the input and output. There are some benefits to writing them in Python. But, um, there's a huge number of modules. We're gonna see how many there are for cloud alone. Um, you can distribute your own. So you can create your own modules and distribute it along with roles. So roles are where you start at the level of the, the, the where if, if all you learn is how Ansible works, then you can do an awful lot with roles. Modules require some Python knowledge or other programming knowledge. Roles is a way of combining YAML, uh, written for Ansible, into coherent groups, right? So if you want to install MySQL, you can create a role that will consistently install MySQL the way that you want. Thankfully, there's galaxy.ansible.com, which is essentially like Drupal.org, but for Ansible, where people share pre-built roles, okay? Uh, excellent resource. The vast majority of software that's out there can, be, can work with roles that are out of the box available. However, it's worth building your own roles. Whenever you have any configuration that you want to be able to share, build it into a role. I'm not going to get into detail about how to do that. The Ansible documentation is really good for it. Um, and you can deploy your own Git-based ones really simply. Okay? And then this is where I was saying there's that difference between the global configuration and then the specific configuration. So how I want to go about running EC2 instances. So I want a particular, I want, you know, the latest Ubuntu 1604, right? The latest LTS or whatever, right? As the default image. That I might build into a role. Because that's kind of like a policy that we want to operate on, right? The fact that I want four of them with whatever host names and so forth, that's at the configuration level. So you can keep that, that difference where in, at the role level is where you would do your testing. Right? At the configuration level, that's just deploying stuff. That's just the actual definition of the infrastructure that you want to have. Is that making sense? Right. Feel free to speak up if you have any questions. If we don't have to wait for the end. Um, so just as a matter of clarity, uh, when we're talking about cloud, for cloud modules within uh, Ansible, the vast majority of um, Ansible projects don't have a concept, or modules don't have a concept of providers, right? But under the cloud ones, which we'll see in a minute, um, everything is grouped under, you know, Linode, uh, OpenStack, Azure, AWS, and so forth, right? And so providers are the companies, generally, that provide infrastructure as a service. It can also be things like OpenStack, where it's an open source project that you can interact with on uh, using these modules. 
the modules themselves are the code that you're running. And those are that, that clause, right, where you describe what it is that you want to operate. So for cloud projects, there's actually 380 at last count. Uh, this was a couple of weeks ago that I wrote this slide. So there's probably more now. Um, and let's actually take a quick look uh, at that. So we go to docs, Ansible. Here's our list of cloud modules. And here, I'll make this a little smaller. So here's Amazon. Amazon alone has 99 modules, right? Or we did last time I looked. Um, then you've got you know, Azure, various other ones, Cloud Stack, DigitalOcean. I mean, there's a lot, right? So depending on the platform you want to build on, the provider you want to build on, chances are that Ansible already provides it. If not, it's very possible that there are uh, open source, you know, available modules that you can deploy yourself to handle them. If not, you can hire somebody to build them. It's actually relatively straightforward. Um, we're not going to get into a lot of detail about it, but I'll, you know, the, the principles are often the same uh, throughout a lot. So there were 25 cloud providers and 380 modules. I mean, so there's a vast area of, of, uh, of modules. Now, the way that this is split up is that uh, in Amazon, for example, you're going to have an EC2 module, right? And then you're going to have an RDS module. And then you're going to have an EC2 fact module that actually just queries the API for data about your EC2 instances. So that's kind of how they split that up, is by functionality, by system that they're running. Linode, for example, has one module, right? It's the Linode module. It allows you to launch VMs, and that's it. Okay? So there's a, there's a wide variety of, of uh, different ways of operating these things and how they've been built. So you know you need to be familiar with your provider. It's not like this is going to replace knowledge of how AWS works. AWS is a huge system with like, or not even one system. It's dozens and dozens of services that they offer. If you're not familiar with how it works, this isn't going to solve it for you, right? Um, so you know you still have to need to have that knowledge, but it really does make things an awful lot quicker. So when I was saying there's a lot of commonalities between how the providers work, a lot of that has to do with how to interact with their systems. So there's always an API that Ansible is going to be calling out to, to actually run this stuff. And the reason that this is uh, particularly important is that usually I work with teams where there might be three or four or more people that are going to be interacting with the system, and we need to secure their access to it and ensure that they have all and only the permissions that they need to do what they're authorized to do. And so that's kind of where we get into this. So one of the first things you're going to do uh, when you're building this stuff out is you're going to get an API key from your system, or it might be multiple API keys from your provider. And um, those are what Ansible is going to use to authenticate with the API. So it's going to call out to the API. It's going to provide that key. And usually what that's going to do from the API standpoint is it's going to be able to identify what account you, you belong to, what user you are, and then it'll be able to look up what you're authorized to do and ensure that whatever it is that you've told Ansible to do on your behalf, um, you have the right to do. And it'll block you anywhere along these lines before it actually triggers the creation of that resource, the change in that resource that you've defined, or the deletion of that resource, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So let's look at what this actually looks like. So, that's legible? Everybody can read that? Okay. So let's take a quick look at what we have here. So this is all in a Git repo. Um, there's some stuff that we don't want to keep track of here. Um, there's some extra tools that I have in here using GNU Make and a project that I've called DrumKit that um, just makes it really easy to write new GNU things so that I can install Ansible from Git, for example, really easily. Um, so that's just some, some tools that, that I use. Then we have the Ansible config file, which just tells Ansible how to do certain things, like ignore deprecation warnings and things of that nature. In this case, we've got uh, the two keys that are needed for interacting with AWS. This is something that's kind of specific to the way I do things with DrumKit. You can do various things, but the way that I've set it up is that I load that into the environment by doing this, space uh, dot d, which is sourcing a uh, file. And what it ends up doing is loading those keys into the environment. And now they're available 
uh, for me to run Ansible with, and then Ansible will pick them up from the environment and authenticate using that. Then we have cloud.yaml. Um, that's an arbitrary name, right? This is where we define the actual uh, infrastructure that we're going to build. Uh, then we have that D, which is just uh, that script to load things into the environment. Uh, Debug.yaml, in this case, is going to query the API and pull down data about um, our systems that we have. And again, this is stuff that um, it's largely customized and running from some roles that I have. Um, there's a couple of files that we deploy to sites, uh, to servers, um, mostly to turn off some Nginx configuration that's problematic. Um, then we've got a definition for our hosts. Uh, inventory, which is mostly not used in this case. A couple of requirements things. So requirements.txt are the pip modules that we need to install in order to run this system. Requirements.yaml, confusingly named very similarly, is a list of the roles that we want to run. Uh, then we have the roles themselves. This is where the .git ignore comes in. I don't actually commit the roles. Those are separate projects. So okay, let's take a quick look in requirements.yaml just so that you can see what this looks like. We're, it's uh, similar to a Drush make file, for example, uh, if you're familiar with that tool. You're basically just saying the various roles that you want, what version you want, and then when you run, uh, in this case, it'll be Ansible Galaxy install dash R tells that we're using a requirements file, and it'll go in and see that everything's already installed, so we're not going to be doing anything further here. If those weren't installed, it would go and fetch them and download them and deploy them to the right place. The right place in this case is defined in our Ansible config file. So there's a roles path. Uh, let me see if I can. Right, that just says put it in the roles directory. Right, it's pretty straightforward. And if we look in the roles directory itself, that's where those got downloaded. Right. Um, and so that's basically the code that's required. Let's take a quick look at the cloud part. So, oh, I actually have it running in a different screen. Bear with me. Here it is. So, this is a YAML file. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. We've got, again, a name. This is something that's going to be, you're going to see with just about all of the cloud modules. Normally with Ansible, you're configuring some server that you've installed, right? So you're going to tell it, go to uh, example.com or 192.168.0.5 or whatever, right? That's the host that you're going to be running this stuff on. In the case of cloud modules, you're running on localhost. You're running on your local system, and that's what's going to call out to the API. So there's not usually an inter intervening system. Uh, you can actually run this off of a server within your cloud, and there's some benefits to doing that potentially as well. And then telling it to use this role, which is a role that uh, I've recently created that allows me to um, build out cloud infrastructure in a way that I like. It's particularly complex. This is where that upward curve of wasted time comes into lately. This is what I've been spending my time doing. What it allows me to do, though, is define my, um, my infrastructure in these variables, and it allows me to look them up with relatively human names, as opposed to things like EC2 IDs. Um, if you've ever looked at these, they're like, you know, I dash A J, you know, like these ridiculous, if uh, unique identifiers that you're never going to be able to remember, right? You have to go look it up, and you would have to enter it into your configuration in order for the system to know that that's the system that you want to do something with, like change the tag. So I prefer to do that in uh, with human names, and I mean they're not very human names, but it's certainly better than an arbitrarily changing um, uh, unique identifier. So in this case, what we've done here is we're saying build me uh, an EC2 instance with uh, using this AMI, put it into the uh, dev group, which is the security groups. Uh, we're going to assign a public IP because we want to actually be able to interact with this thing. Uh, eventually, we'll put a load balancer. We are not going to. I'm going to put a load balancer in front of this and remove that configuration. Um, the instance type in this case, um, I'm actually looking up my uh, user and using the key that I have that I used to deploy my EC2 instance, so that makes it really easy for me to then be able to SSH into it. I've got the subnet I want to deploy it to. There's a bunch of other stuff I could add here. This exact count and count tag are ways for us to uh, only ever launch one of these. I want to be able to run this 
command that I'm about to run repeatedly and not have it launch a new VM every time, right? I want it to launch exactly the VMs that I've defined in here and make it thus item potent. So um, this is actually exactly the way we want it. And so I'm going to now run Ansible uh, Playbook Cloud. And what it's going to do is it's going to gather some data about the system. So it's looking up these facts. This is that stuff that's in that role, right? So most of the time, once I've written this, I no longer have to worry about it too much. And then it starts to gather this data about the systems that we're looking at. In this case, it's just some debug stuff because it's a work in progress. And now it's actually provisioning that instance. Um, that could go by very quickly, or it can wait. Uh, the reason I'm telling it to wait is that later on, I want to be able to SSH into that system. So I want to wait for it to actually be booted um, before proceeding. And so that's an option um, that I had set. So that's where that wait goes through. And we can see that it made a change. If we run it again, um, it's not going to pause at the point of provisioning because it's going to know that that system has already been provisioned. Everything will be green. Um, the way Ansible works is that light blue is just a notice that it's doing something that you can usually ignore. The green is everything's good, we didn't need to make any changes. Yellow is a warning, something happened here. Pay attention. It's not a bad thing, it just means something, something occurred. It's usually uh, a new uh, configuration that you're deploying or something like that. And then red is the one where it'll, it'll be a debug issue, where you're going to have to dig into what's going on there. Um, and so now if we switch back to our EC2 console and refresh, unsurprisingly, um, I need to relog it. So there's our new instance. Right? Uh, now what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to copy that since I'm here, the IP address. I'll use that later. Um, and so now we've built our system, right? Now we want to configure the system. And so in this case, let's take a quick look at what that Ansible looks like. In this case, we're calling it site. And this is, um, again, it's going to use the cloud module. This time it's not going to provision any resources. It's just going to gather data so that we have all of that information available to us when we're running our configuration, so that if we need to look up the host name, for example, we know where to go look for it. Uh, then it's going to run some tasks. So right now all it's doing is adding these instances to a dynamic inventory. So an inventory is really just a list of the servers that you have and metadata about them. Um, Ansible provides dynamic inventory scripts, which are usually written in Python again, that query the API directly and then output a bunch of data. Um, I'm doing this myself because I can. Basically, uh, I like to have that human naming aspect of it, and normally what it outputs is keyed by that unique identifier that changes when you tear down a system and rebuild it. So that's, that's one of the main reasons that I operate on this basis. Then there's some basic stuff that you need to do to all EC2 instances before you do anything further, uh, especially do any kind of eager installation, and then you do the eager installation itself. Um, I'm going to launch this and then switch back and we can take a look at that while it's running. So here we're going to go Ansible, Playbook, in this case site.yaml. And so again, it's now looking up the facts and it's just going to go through and in this case it's going to connect with the server via SSH and it's going to do a bunch of configuration on the server itself. So in this case it's going to ensure Python is installed. Right? It's going to find out some other information about it. It's going to set the host name. Right? Just things like that. Then it's going to go on and install Nginx, PHP, MySQL, and so forth. So let's let that run for a bit and go back over here and just take a quick look at what's involved there. So if we look in hosts, types, EC2. Now, what I'm not showing you here is that there's a bunch of other stuff that I had done previously where I, I configured the VPC, right, the virtual private cloud, uh, subnets, security groups. Uh, various other required infrastructure to make all of this stuff work particularly well. Out of the box, AWS, when you provision a new, um, a new account, will provide you defaults for the vast majority of those things. Um, my preference is to actually manage just about everything so that uh, if the default changes, for example, we're not caught with you know, a change uh, that's not controlled. So in this case, 
back in here. So for all of my EC2 hosts, this is what I'm going to want to run. I'm going to want to define things like an admin user and my public key, and it's going to deploy this to these systems such that I can SSH in as me uh, from that point forward. Um, just little things like that sets my password. Um, in this case, Python is really the only requirement, Python 2.4 even, is uh, the only requirement for Ansible to run on the remote hosts. You don't have to have Ansible installed, there's no agent required or anything like that. Everything happens over SSH. So, um, however, Ubuntu systems don't have Python installed by default in EC2 images. So we need to do a bit of a, a trick here where we're using the raw module, right? That's the module that we're, we're using here. The raw module means just run a command over SSH, period. Don't be smart about it, just do this thing. Um, and so that's, that's how we get bootstrapped into being able to run more complex stuff. Um, gathering facts is, is done by querying the system and saying, you know, what's my IP address? What's my uh, host name? Things of that nature that then become available later on in the um, in the configuration that we're using. In this case, I've commented out uh, a bunch of things here um, just to save a bit of time. Um, but normally what I would do is run this admin users thing, which would create that user I mentioned. Um, I run NTP, right? You, you wanna have your systems keep up to date with the time. I mean, it's really simple, right, obviously, but it doesn't come out of the box. And so by doing this, that's all you ever have to do. And now all your systems are always going to be up to date on the time. I, like, it seems small, but if your system's time drifts past a couple of minutes, you can have really, really hard to debug issues as a result of that. Like I've spent days when I, before I knew that this was the kind of problem, like a class of problems that you could really have um, debugging this stuff because the, 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 the warning or the error is never your system's time is out of date. And I've seen that once on one system. Right? Most of the time it's something completely unrelated and it takes for it can be really hard to track down. Um, then we have some security stuff, right? We want to lock down this server in some way. We want to turn off root uh, SSH, for example, things of that nature. So this is the kind of stuff that you set in place as a policy, essentially saying, I want to run this on all my EC2 instances, and then it's kind of fire and forget. From that point forward, you never have to think about it, right? Except when something breaks and then you have to go fix it, but you only have to fix it the once for that particular bug. And then it does some, some tasks. Uh, in this case, it's doing that hostname setup stuff. Um, this, again, is the next thing to target building into a role and then just making it that one line that's done over here, right? Let's take a quick look at what's going on on our other side. So here we're actually almost done. We're actually almost done having our system all the way set up. It's just restarting some web servers and, and MySQL. And there we go. So in this case, it made 52 changes, right? So it did things like install various PHP, um, what are they called, modules, extensions? I don't remember, anyway. Um, and then it went all the way through installing Eager. And so what I'm gonna do now is just hack my Etsy hosts file. Normally what I actually do with this kind of stuff is I create um, a root 53 entry so that I don't have to do this, right? That the new server has a host name that's available to me. That gets a little bit complicated because usually I do that within uh, a VPN and I'm not going to try to do that uh, from a conference center. So in this case, what, I'm, what I am gonna do though is simply paste in the IP address, wrong one. All right, let's get this again. SSH into that system. Now I hadn't set it up to create my user, so I'm going to have to do it as the Ubuntu user, but it did use my key. Oh, right, of course. New system, so SSH, you know, yells at you that, wait a minute, maybe there's a man on the middle attack. So this is pretty straightforward. Just give me a minute. In case you haven't noticed, um, 
Macs are not my system of choice. I usually use Linux, so I'm uh, a little unfamiliar with uh, how to operate some of these things in an effective manner. So bear with me there. All right, so let's SSH in. Here's our new system. It's up and running. We can see that MySQL, uh, well, here, let's F5. MySQL is running. We've got a couple of PHP FPM processes running and so forth. So that's all good. Um, in this case, because it's eager, I'm going to become the eager user. And then I'm going to get a one time login link. And let's see if this is working now. There we go. So we're back up and running, uh, having just destroyed it and then rebuilt it in all the configuration that I like. Um, and obviously you can extend this in a bunch of different ways, right? So the current project I'm working on is a high availability system. So before it installs Eager, it mounts an EFS mount where Eager is going to be installed. The next steps on that are going to be, well, we already have an RDS uh, system defined. Um, then we're going to uh, deploy a couple of other servers that are going to act as web nodes that are going to mount the EFS as NFS on their systems. And then we're going to create a load balancer in front of that, split the traffic between those systems. Um, you know, there's no single point of failure in a system like that. It's not particularly high performance. Uh, you know, we can then start looking at layering in things like um, you know, varnish systems in front of it. Most of the time when I do that kind of thing, there's like multiple layers just across different availability zones so that a whole data center can go down uh, without really negatively affecting performance. Um, in this case, we're going a little bit smaller scale. And in this case in particular, it's just one system that we built. But you get the idea, I think, based on this, of how easy it is to move forward with that. And um, I think that's pretty much all I had in mind uh, to talk to you guys about today. So I'll just put this back up and uh, answer any questions you may have. So anybody have any questions? Did you follow all of that? It's fairly straightforward. It wasn't. OK. Um, anybody plan on actually doing any of this stuff? Is this, is this something that, yeah? I mean, it takes some getting used to. There's a learning curve, right? I mean, this isn't, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily, um, you know, like I say, it doesn't, it doesn't make it easier to manage AWS from the standpoint of like, if you don't understand how EFS works, it's not gonna do that for you, right? Um, however, it, it makes it much easier to do it a second time. Right. Once you figured it out the first time, you don't have to figure it out again. Right. If that's what the whole infrastructure as code part is. Can I have a question? Sure. Um, when, how, and why did you start using this? What, what's the breaking point? Do you want to automate this, or you know, you're working in house on your own stuff, your own server, or you do it professionally and then you know you need to automate? So um, I used to work at a company or a sort of co-op called Kumbit who were the um, agency behind Eager at the time. And one of the things we were trying to do was kind of monetize Eager in some way that would allow us to continue working and developing it. Um, and so we decided to offer hosted Eager, right? So you can just pay us, we'll run the server for you, we'll install Eager, we'll keep it up to date, and then we can do various other things like keep all of your Drupal sites up to date and stuff like that. So Eager makes that really easy. Um, so, at that time, um, Puppet was what we were using for that. And uh, I built out a system that made it relatively straightforward for us to uh, launch new VMs and install Eager and maintain Eager on. Um, at some point, I just gave up on Puppet. Um, I like Puppet. I mean, there's, there's some really interesting things, especially from more of a computer science standpoint, because it has these like directed cyclic graphs and stuff like that. I'm not even sure that's the right, the right term for it anymore. Um, the problem is that uh, with Python, you have to be explicit about dependencies. So if one clause depends on some other clause or one resource depends on another resource, um, you have to specify that and you can, it'll run things out of order. It'll figure out what the proper order of dependencies are and then run that. The challenge is if you're getting into something really complex with that is that you can end up with these loops of dependencies. So it, it, it can't figure out which thing to run first because um, it thinks there's a loop, 
when I can tell you 100% there was no loop there, but I couldn't convince it otherwise. And so eventually I just said, you know, screw it. Um, I, I, I need to be able to move forward. The thing I like about Ansible in particular, so that's why I started with this kind of automation. The thing I like about Ansible is that it's sort of driving principle is radical simplicity, right? This stuff is complex enough without having to figure out how your configuration management system works, right? Ansible is so straightforward, it's like having, um, you know, super-powered bash, kind of. Like, it just, you know, you tell it once how, to, how you want to do apt stuff, and it'll just do it from that point forward. And it's um, really easy to read. You can read it almost like English uh, or French. I mean, if you wanted to do it that way. The, the, there's obviously the name thing, but the, uh, the, the way you pass in options are very clear after, you know, once you get familiar with what it is that you're operating on. Um, and so it just, it just kind of snowballed from there. At that point, you know, I started to learn a little bit how roles work. That made everything even that much easier. Um, and again, it uses, it uses YAML. And I just, I like YAML so much um, that it makes it really easy to, to do these things. And then now I'm doing some stupidly complex stuff that I'm going to have to refactor into Python because it's stupid to do it in YAML. Um, but you know, it's, it's a good sort of prototyping way of thinking through what you're trying to accomplish. So that, that's kind of where the, the cloud, some of that cloud role comes in. But that's basically, from there, I mean, once we were doing the services, that was, it supported some of that. And then from there, um, I started, you know, people would hire me to install an eager system, a high availability eager system for them, right? So, you know, there's only so many times that that's new and exciting. And then eventually it just becomes, uh, well, let's just do this easily and quickly, and that's that's what Ansible provides. Right? So, I mean, as you saw, we, it took maybe 15 minutes at the end of our thing to go from nothing to a fully configured eager server. Uh, and that's, you know, in, in terms of that initial slide where we were, um, you know, we were looking at how much, you know, this one, I install eager a lot, right? If I do it by hand, it might take an hour. If I'm launching the system beforehand, you know, and then deploying an SSH key and creating users, that's just a pain, right? So if I can save myself, in this case, at least an hour, you know, it's definitely worth investing a bunch of time in doing this. And then I'm a huge free software advocate, so I make all of this stuff available um, to everybody else to use, and thus making it easier for people to adopt eager. Right? I mean, I do this with a lot of other stuff too, but uh, that's kind of my, my bread and butter. That kind of stuff. Uh, what was the advantages of Ansible Tower? I've heard about it, but I... Ansible Tower? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it's a UI for Ansible, uh, right? Um, I'm sure it has some benefits, I mean, uh, but I would recommend you check it out. I, I don't use it. Um, for whatever it's worth, I'm planning on the next generation of Eager, probably having an Ansible Tower fault engine for actually doing stuff instead of writing in PHP how you write a vhost and stuff which it currently does so you know, there's, uh, I'll probably be looking at tower a little bit closer just to make sure that we're not I'm not just reinventing the wheel completely there um, but yeah it's a it's a UI for Ansible as far as I can tell um, any other questions if not I think uh, we're coming up on the top of the hour or well quarter past so thank you very much